Our first post-coffee session today is on a topic that will be of much interest to entrepreneurs who are looking for information on angel investing in Singapore. To tell us about this, I'd like to invite on stage now Mr. Ko Bon Hui, Chairman of Credence Partners Private Limited. Mr. Ko Bon Hui also serves as Managing Director of GK Go Holdings Limited and Executive Chairman and CEO at Sunningdale Precision Industries Limited. He has been an advisor to the Board of Directors of InnoValues Precision Limited since June 2005 and served as CEO of DBS Group Holdings Limited since December 2007 and Chairman of the Board from January 2006 to May 2010. Mr. Ko Good afternoon and thank you all very much. I can't believe that uh, on such a wonderful day, you're all here trying to uh, listen to angel investing. Uh, I must start off with a slight correction. I think that the uh, resume was probably extracted from uh, the internet because I'm not associated with GK Go Holdings. <laughs> so let's just make a, 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 it tells you about the danger of picking up information from the internet. Let me start by telling you that there is a lesson to be learned from the fact that I'm standing here today. And that is, do not agree to meetings arranged by good friends. I agreed to meet with Hari Haran, which I think some of you know because he's helped to organize this, at the behest of an ex-colleague, with the absolutely full intention of being courteous and then saying no. <laughs> but the prowess of IIM graduates are legendary, and I still do not quite know how I was persuaded to do this. But before I start, let me just say that my views on angel investing are personal. Credence, the company that I am with now, is a private equity fund, not a venture capital fund, and my partners and I in Credence do not invest in startups as our mandate limits us to companies that have both revenue and EBITDA. But my partners and I are all angel investors in our personal capacities because we do actually like the idea of uh, starting things up. Let me start off with a 30,000-foot view. Singapore has made a lot of progress in research and development over the last two decades, and the topic that follows the emerging entrepreneurial boom is encouraging. To me, it means that at least people are thinking about it. So let me start off with a little factoid. Singapore's nominal GDP in 2011 was US $240 billion. If we focus only on tech startups and define success as taking a startup on a long journey to IPO, and we narrow this down to an IPO on the NASDAQ, Singapore has had five. Israel's GDP in 2011 was $242 billion almost identical. Like Singapore, they also have a small market. They have 71 companies listed on the NASDAQ. Of course, the comparison is not perfect and it is not my intention to dwell on the numerical details. Many more startups in Singapore may be oriented towards non-tech endeavors and many of them proceed to be listed on the Singapore Exchange, but a factor of 15 gives us some pause for reflection. I realize that almost everybody here is from the IIM, so the, what I'm about to say next may not be so popular, but I will tell you that in a Harvard Business School article on entrepreneurship, Josh Lerner cited the following. His definition of success was the one that I just co-opted, a venture-backed startup that makes it all the way to an IPO. First-time entrepreneurs have an 18% chance of succeeding. That's pretty good, right? I couldn't quite believe the statistic when I saw it because 18% sounds quite high to me. Now, many of us who have backed startups sometimes believe that if an entrepreneur fails the first time, he will be better prepared the second time around, and the assumption that we work on is the fact that smart people learn from their mistakes. Well, Learner's paper goes on to show that the success rate of previously failed entrepreneurs 
is 20%. So barely different from the first timers. Even more interesting is the fact that successful entrepreneurs, that is those who have gone, taken a company all the way to the IPO, if they subsequently start new ventures, their probability of success is 30%. So, in short, I've glossed over all of the assumptions in this study, and I will admit that there are many ways to view these little factoids, but the one that I like us to the one that I really like is to encourage anyone who is thinking about starting a venture to do so, because your chances are just about as good as anyone else. So, my conclusion is, there is a lot of room for entrepreneurship in Singapore, even if we just compare ourselves to Israel, or Finland, or Denmark. That is, other similarly small countries. And number two, since your chance of being successful is just about as good as those who have previously been successful, or those who have previously failed, or even those who have previously succeeded, you are starting on even terms, therefore go ahead and take the plunge. So let me now move on from the macro environment to what I call the nuts and bolts, because as an angel investor, one of the questions that I'm often asked is, uh, what do I look for? I personally spend a lot of time with the entrepreneur himself. Why is he or she doing this? Of course, everyone needs to be motivated by the money that you can make if you are successful, but it is a matter, in my opinion, of degree. My experience is that if it is the only or the major reason for doing a startup, it is more likely to fail because disagreements about sharing the pie, even within the team, is often likely to arise and distract. Let me give you just one example of this. About a year ago, we saw a startup in what we thought was an, provided an outstanding product and service. We liked the business model a lot, as the product wasn't sold. It was in fact placed in service for recurring, recurring revenue based on usage. So you remember how Xerox started, right? But the valuation was extremely high, and the four banker founders paid themselves a total of one million, that's a one million pounds, per annum. So one year later, fast forward to today, they are still raising funds. In the meantime, we have seen three other companies in the same space develop. The moral of the story is that there is no such thing as an idea that is so great that there is no competition. So if money is your only motivation, you are likely to encounter all kinds of other issues that prevents you from tackling the competition as it arises. We also work very hard to try to assess the entrepreneur's perspective, or in particular, his breadth of perspective. For, for those of us who are dealing in Singapore, too many of the Singapore startups focus on the Singapore market. But let's be honest, 100% of a small market is a small business. It is not sustainable as an investor-backed venture. It is sustainable only as a sole enterprise or partnership. By now, many of the local entrepreneurs have understand this, and they come up with business plans that show growth all over Asia. But for the plan to be credible, the team that is developed needs to have had an Asian experience outside of Singapore. In this context, it is my feeling that entrepreneurs in China and India have a much bigger advantage. You can grow your home market significantly before moving out, and in some cases, you never actually have to leave your home market at all. We also question significantly, examine significantly whether the entrepreneur has an idea of what it takes to succeed. Very often, too many entrepreneurs focus on the product or the service they want to introduce, and too little on the execution details of what it takes. Very often, the business plan does not address compet competitors, or if they do, the treatment is far too cursory. They have not thought thoroughly about, what, about the team that they have to build to try to make this venture work. 
one-man shows are very often not investable enterprises. They also sometimes have difficulty articulating how they will build competitive advantage. And in, by competitive advantage, I do not mean that it is about patents and intellectual property. Because sometimes the best competitive advantage is being the first mover or the quickest to scale. Just as important is to understand why and how the entrepreneur picked the business to start. My experience tells me that the deeper the domain expertise of the founder in his selected enterprise, the greater the probability of success. The February 2nd issue of Today, which is a newspaper here in Singapore, tells the story of John Tan, who is the CEO of Asia Capital Reinsurance. Today, the largest reinsurance company in Southeast Asia. What it did not cover was the fact that the venture started with a group of angel investors in 2004. John was very upfront with us at that time. At the end of 12 months, the company would either receive a license to operate, and then it still had to raise even more capital, or we would be out of business and the angel investors will get nothing in return. Yet the process of raising the angel round took less than two weeks. It was obvious that he, as the individual founder, had huge domain expertise. The rationale for the business was sound, but that's another story which is too long to go into now. And most importantly, he was able to identify a core group of people who would join if the venture got off the ground. Another good example of what angels look for, is a look for is a company called Razor. The company is focused on gaming, and I don't mean casinos, okay? <laughs> um, it's in computer gaming. And in this audience, I don't have to tell you that in terms of revenue, the gaming business is now larger than the entertainment business. All of Hollywood and Bollywood and all of the movies and TV in the world is today smaller than the computer gaming business. So, in a sense, Razer is in the right business. But nothing would have been achieved except for the fact that the founder, Tan Ming Liang, is passionate about the business. As I said, the money is important, but it's not the only thing he focuses on. He has complete domain expertise. He spends a lot of time playing games, which I suppose now is part of work, and he has an ambition that is global. He is not the easiest person in the world to work for, with or work for, but he has clear ideas, for better or worse, about what Razor should be all about. A great idea that addresses a small market is not an investable venture. As I had mentioned earlier, too many entrepreneurs fail to accurately size their addressable market or are completely unrealistic about their ability to penetrate the market. Spending time thinking about this pays off in many ways. Even when they do address the potential market, many do not give sufficient thought about distribution. The grunge work of figuring out how to get the product or service to the final buyers or recipients of the service. They underestimate the cost of building up direct sales, and they overestimate the productivity or the ability of their sales force to close deals. If distribution is required, they have often have not spoken to potential distributors many of whom are already entrenched with your competitors and incumbents and will not take a risk with your startup. I had mentioned earlier that one of the major weaknesses is co addressing the competition. Competition fights back, and this is often underestimated. Just as an example, anyone who understands technology available today cannot be faulted for coming to the conclusion that old-fashioned telcos should go the way of the dinosaur. Yet almost all of them are still here. 
they still make more money than most startups, and stories about their demise have been greatly exaggerated. Never underestimate the power of the incumbent when you are proposing to attack their fortress. In summary, it is my view that the probability of success in any venture starts with the person and the team that is going to be built to execute the idea. Preferably, they are addressing a large and growing market because it is always better to have the wind behind your back. And they have a realistic understanding of the competition, both other startups and the incumbents, if you intend to play in an established business. I would just like to conclude with one final snip snippet. Remember, we talked earlier about the fact that the probability of success is 20 to 30 percent, no matter whether you are a first time entrepreneur, a failed entrepreneur, or a successful entrepreneur. But there is one way to improve your odds. In a Harvard Business School case study of 2005, so that's not so long ago, it reported on an analysis of 300 separate investments, and I would like to tell you the opening conclusion. I quote, if you had a full-time mentor who was not part of the company's management, that's a very important phrase, by the way, and who had actually run both a startup and a large organization before, the success rate increases from less than 25% to more than 80%. I particularly like this observation because it seems to provide job security for people like myself. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <clears throat> and, I, and, I, and I apologize for being hoarse because I'm just coming down with a cold. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you also for helping us stick with the schedule. Um, I did request.